Hello guys, you're watching Halbone Flash videos and today we have got Staging Labs. Uh, Frankie, welcome to this chat and thank you so much for joining us. Um, tell us a little bit about me. yourself, of course. Cool, so yeah, so thanks for having me on this uh, AMA. I'm excited to dig into our, to our story. So my name is Frankie. I'm one of the co-founders of Staging Labs and we build Safe Route. Before this, I was a, a VC. I was a general manager for Entrepreneur First, which is a fund based in the UK. I led their uh, Singapore and Canada teams. I led investments there for uh, in over 50 venture-backed companies. And that's how I actually got into crypto. So in 2017, I got into crypto by investing in startups as a VC. Uh, not all of our bets panned out, uh, but two of our bets are doing quite well. So you might have heard of companies called uh, Merkle Science and Propine Capital, both based in, in Singapore, who have gone on to build tremendous companies in their in their spaces. Um, and happy to have been, you know, considered part of their very, very early stages from uh, day and hour zero. Um, and before VC, I was a product manager at three different startups. Uh, one company IPO'd, one company got acquired by Intuit, uh, and then the third failed miserably. <laughs> uh, but that's a that's a story for another day. It's a learning process. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing your background. I always find these stories super interesting how you went into VC space looked at it yeah. from a crypto perspective and then ended up in this industry lots of different hats yeah yeah definitely and that's that tends to be like a completely like an industry DNA as well people tend to yeah. be in different hats and then they find their their uh thing that inspires them the most yeah. so speaking <laughs> of tell us about staging labs how how did you come come across this idea and concept and how was this born yeah, so I'll start with the story before sharing what it is, because it'll make more sense to, uh, once you know the, the founding story. Um, so it starts with me getting scammed. Um, and I was, <laughs> funny enough, I was in this actual room when it happened. So like uh, every time wow. I do share the story, there's a bit of, you know, PTSD that comes up. Um, so the story goes, essentially, my, my co-founder sends me a link to an NFT project. Um, and because he sent it to me, my guard was already down, right? Because it's someone that you trust. Uh, but unfortunately, that website had been compromised, uh, though it was the you know, real domain, it pointed to a Discord server that was compromised. And when I went to, into the Discord server to validate the NFTs I had in my wallet, thinking I was just getting access to some private channels, I accidentally signed transactions uh, that pulled away asset, assets from my wallet. And I, in the end, I lost $10,000 personal money. Um, okay. And it, I felt awful. Um, it was embarrassing. It was... I felt guilt. I felt shame. I uh, didn't know how to react. I didn't know what to do. Like, I wasn't even sure if I, like, I had like an ENS domain that they didn't steal. Like, I didn't know what, what to do with it. It's like, if I add in more ether, they're just going to steal that too. Like, and just like completely feeling vulnerable. Um, and it took quite a few hours uh, to really like, um, you know, calm down from that emotional roller coaster. But when I did, I, I shared the story with my co-founder, Jake. And, you know, uh, almost as a joke, I shared, like, I wish I had some sort of like, oh crap button or SOS or panic button that would have saved my, you know, my assets more as a joke. Um, but in typical, you know, engineering fashion, he went away for a few hours, came back and said, no, I can actually solve that. Uh, and I called bullshit. Uh, I, I had spent quite a few years as a VC and, and poking holes into stories and, and trying to figure out why something won't work. <laughs> it was mm -hmm. something that I, I was a specialist in. And so but everything I brought up, um, he had uh, some sort of hypothesis for or already had thought about. And so the more I poked, the more I realized that he was actually onto something. And so um, over like a few weeks, I, I figured, OK, maybe Jake is onto something. Let's let's go build. But we needed to like validate it first with other people. Like I didn't want to just like solve a problem that I faced myself, which is some validation. But we wanted to figure out if others had gone through it. So we talked to hundreds of crypto investors. And naturally, I think intuitively, knowing that we're both in this space, it's it's quite intuitive to know that most, you know, if not more than half of the people I spoke to had also gone scammed. But th there was an interesting insight where, like, they wouldn't share that they got scammed unless I brought it up first, because there's a natural, like, like def defense mechanism or kind of psychological safety that you need to build first. Uh, yeah. But that, even that was expected. I think, like, people don't really open up. Um, what I didn't expect from those calls is, one, people did nothing about it. Like they at most like flag it on like marketplaces, but no one went to the authorities. No one, no one even shared about it. Um, and then two, for those that did bring it up, which is very few, they brought it up to be uh, self-serving, like only to to share that like, oh, like, you know, look at me, I got rugged. This is part of crypto's education, part of crypto's onboarding, kind of like a humble brag, which, which is very toxic um, for, yeah. you know, and it's, it was, it felt like uh almost like being gaslit to, to a certain uh, extent. And so I think there needs to be a change of narrative uh, when someone gets hacked. 
Um, we want to make people realize that it's not okay that this happens. Um, like $10,000 is a devastating amount, yes. Um, but I come from a, uh, an area of privilege where like it, it will not ruin my my year, whereas in other parts of the world, and I've spent a lot of my years working in Southeast Asia, $10,000 is devastating, right? It can be life-changing and mature, like family-changing. And so, yeah, so the story came from that um, and really wanting to make uh, crypto more accessible by making it safer, helping users avoid making mistakes, but also avoid devastating losses um, and to build something that's simple enough for uh, anyone to use. Well, wow, that's an amazing and a crazy story. Um, again, like uh, I'm, I'm so surprised by the elements that went into place. So tell us about Staging Labs itself. What exactly yes. did you build? Yes. So with that inside of knowing that people need safeguards um, and also while talking to people, we realized that like people also expected safeguards. Like if you come from the world of traditional finance, like you have spending limits on your bank account, on your credit cards. Like these are things that people are already used to, right? So knowing that uh, we're building something called SafeRoot and the mission is to make crypto safe and easy to use. What SafeRoot does is that it builds on-chain safeguards that protect assets and they protect it by automatically transferring assets to a backup wallet in the case of a mistake hack or scam. Um, so an analogy that you can use is essentially uh, SafeRoot helps you set up safeguards so that you can steal assets away from a hacker before a hacker steals it from you. Um, another analogy could be, uh, this is a bit more militaristic, but uh, my co-founder likes to use this one because it's also clear. It's almost like a sentry gun that spots transactions that shouldn't happen and shoots the ones down that you don't want to happen uh, before they, they impact you financially, right? So a use case could be uh, you have an NFT that you really want to protect. It could be a blue chip, you know, an ape, a moonbird, a Nazuki, but also could just be like an ENS domain or an unstoppable domain where it's something that represents your brand, your social presence, and it's it's valuable to you, even though it doesn't necessarily have like high financial value. So if a, a user is tricked into signing a transaction that they shouldn't have signed, or worse, they're fished um, and someone else is acting on their behalf, we will have safeguards in place to know that this asset shouldn't leave the wallet. And essentially, once it is triggered, the transfer, we move the asset away uh, to another wallet that they own. So you could think of it as like a safety net for your, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of analogies, <laughs> or the, the last line Makes of defense. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, and the goal is really to have added protection for any wallet um, so that uh, people will not make, uh, well, eventually, even if they do make mistakes, that they're not penalized for it. Definitely yeah. something we seem to need in today's time. So uh, tell us yeah. a bit about the team as well. Um, we have sure. you and Jake, your co-founder. Who else is yes, there Yes, so we're this? a pretty lean team. So yeah, so my co-founder, Jake, comes from a distributed systems background. He actually wanted to pursue a PhD um, in the space back in 2017. So that's how he entered crypto from more of like an academic background. Um, but he also spoke to a number of academics and realized that going into industry was a bit more financially rewarding. So he opted out of that. Uh, but the, there is a deep desire on that. Uh, and so he ended up working at a company called Sonos, uh, where he was the lead engineer for a number of their distributed systems. He has a number of patents under his belt and, and also worked on security at, uh, at, while at Sonos. Um, and the rest of the core team is, comes from uh, established crypto companies like Dapper Labs, Polygon, uh, and a number have worked on security teams as well, um, but not a very big team. We're, we're still lean and, and small. Great. That's the start of way to go, I guess. We're talking today because of our collaborative security work, um, and yeah. uh, we we are your cybersecurity partners. So tell us a bit about your security strategy. How do you internally envision it, and why go with Talborn? Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll speak at it from a more narrative point of view, and um, we're we're going to do another space to go super deep into this uh, with my co-founder Jake. But really, our approach is to take a, a hybrid approach uh, to take the stability and battle testedness uh, and reliability of traditional Web2 stacks and then pair it with temper resistance and immutability of Web3, right? So one, we start with like simplicity as a foundation. Uh, I think you hear this a lot where like you keep your lines of code as minimal and streamlined as much as right. possible so that you reduce, you know, attack uh, surfaces. We tend to see that like a lot of the more complex projects uh, tend to have more risk. And so that's a, just a common tale. We wanted to remove as much uh, ability from our product as much as possible and, and put things back into the, the hands of users. So SafeRoot is designed to be tamper resistant. So what that means is a user deploys their own smart contract and chooses which assets moves where under which circumstance. And SafeRoot, the only power it has is to move it on their behalf, but only up based on what the user has already uh, pre-configured, right? And we're designing it to be as fast as possible and to move it as quickly uh, and as efficiently 
but the control remains in the user um, hands. Um, so even if in the worst case scenario, uh, you know, our, we have a rogue actor internally and we haven't fixed uh, and deployed like the necessary controls to do so, the worst that can happen is the asset moves into another wallet that the user owns, uh, which provides us one with like a, a deep sense of like stability and calm, but also wanting to do things for the right reason. So uh, really, really designed to be tamper resistant. And on top of that, uh, I mean, we do the typical like layered approach to security. So obviously an independent third-party audits from reputable firms like uh, Halborn uh, to, in, you know, to validate all our code and infrastructure. And we're doing multiple audits with multiple partners. We are also going to open source key components. So it forces us to write, that uh, forces us to write clear code, um, adhere to really high standards and prove to people that what we're building is something that they can have faith in. And like most uh, security is not just, you know, towards the end of an audit, uh, security is uh, top priority right throughout the entire product life cycle from beginning to end. But we know that even if we put everything, every ounce of effort and time into it, we're not going to be 100%. So we over-engineer for safety, assume breaches will occur and plan for the worst, uh, which is what I just spoke about before. And our goal is really to have a high bar um, while giving users full control. Got it. And it's always uh, good to hear that you're taking security from the beginning to end as a yes. process. Well, I mean, we're, uh, we're, we're pro protecting people's assets. So it's it's a requirement for, for a company like ours. All right, thank you. With that, uh, my interview right now is a wrap. And thank you so much for joining us again. I had a great time talking to you. And yeah. hopefully our audience also loves this as much as I did. Thank you again. Thanks, Thanks for having me.